Welcome back. We are still looking at the issue. The withdrawal of the invitation of the Cardinal State Governor Nasir El Rufai to the Nigerian Bar Association has certainly ruffled some feathers in the last few days. Some branches of the NBA, particularly in the North, have threatened to withdraw their participation in the NBA conference. However, we ask, doesn't the NBA have the power or right to invite whomever it pleases to his conference? Or is this because the person in question is the governor? And what are the potential repercussions for these decisions? Joining us to discuss this is Mr. Dele Farotimi, a legal practitioner, and he likes to be addressed as a retired lawyer. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Let's set the foundation. We understand that uh, this is beyond, I have the right to invite you and I have the right to withdraw my invitation. Is it true? Mm. There is this, um, there is a proverb. It comes from Arabic traditions. It says that you cannot complain about having lines underneath your armpit when you have slept, when you have slept in a bed with a dog. So if your dog sleep in your bed, you can hardly complain about having lice, dog flea underneath your armpit. In the first place, for an association of lawyers that has the clear motor promoting the rule of law, clearly underneath its name, Nigerian Bar Association, and right underneath, promoted the rule of law. Exactly, no, fine, let me say this. I believe a couple of years or so, uh, Mama Dubuari was invited to a similar conference. And the gentleman, at, we were not spared the shame because there wasn't any COVID. Everybody sat down there, the silks, the hold wigs and the new wigs. And we had the president declare before that August assembly in what should be a gathering of the priests and servants in the temple Fantastic. of justice. And it declared that whatever the state declares to be in its national security interest is supreme over and above the law. He declared the reign of impunity in the halls <laughs> populated by the high priests of justice in Nigeria. Mm. And this time around, the Nigeria Bar Association couldn't find any distinguished personalities in Nigeria. It had to find probably the worst assemblage of people with the least respect for the law or the rule of law, for that matter, from former president Olusha Gwabaso, your general, retired, to hear <laughs> some wicked. And then, Elfai, which one of those men should be found in a gathering of lawyers? But our association elected, the same association that had remained completely quiet and could not find the grace to say a word all the time when our members have been clamped in jail, when egregious breaches of human rights have been committed in Nigeria and the law has been drowned, if not completely killed. This MBA had not found the grace to talk, but this MBA found the grace to be invited. So yeah, people can say anything they like. The MBA dragged itself into this. It is the one that had dragged the seven to this because it should never ever have been found anywhere near this controversy. There are enough that should have engaged his attention. There are enough. So if all of a sudden some people woke up and made noise about El Rufai's involvement, and then they subjectively, because it is subjective, on what basis have you removed El Rufai that you have found the grace to qualify Obaso Job and Wicked? Okay. If, it's, if whatever parameters you have used disqualifies both 
of the others. So that is the issue here. It's not really a bad. The grand issue is that we had no business inviting okay. any one of these uh, persons. Let, let's look at some the, the grounds. Let's look at what led to his withdrawal. Uh, we understand there is a petition written by some group of lawyers and they continue the signature and at the end of the day, the planning committee or the, the technical committee had to you know, recommend to the executive and the executive took that decision. So it wasn't the case of the people that invited now wanted to withdraw it, but for the petition. So in this case, Maybe those such petitions hasn't come to the likes of uh, Governor Wiki and that of Ambassador. So can we look at how this has turned out to be now? We have majorly lawyers from the North saying this is unjust. Look, it is in the Nigerian character to view every issue from ethno-religious viewpoints. But the beauty of this situation is that the truth is constant. I am clear as to why these men do not qualify to speak before an assemblage of lawyers. And if you're speaking about the existence of petitions, I am aware that Ramimba, the radical agenda movement in the Nigerian Bar Association, to which I belong, has already submitted a petition to the Nigerian Bar Association demanding the withdrawal of the speaking engagements that had been assigned to both General Basanjo and Governor Wike. Because what is source for the goose, or whatever the Oibo says, is goose for the whatever they say. But here is the point, my brother. How is the head of the hape that makes it different from the head of the gorilla? If Rufai does not qualify to speak amongst lawyers, neither do those two. Now, we can speak about the fact that there was a petition, and that is the basis of the withdrawal. But I am speaking to something higher, and that is the fact that what led the Nigerian Bar Association itself into a situation where it does not even begin to understand what is in its own best interest and it begins to invite undesirable persons to come and speak in an assemblage of lawyers. Exactly what has become of us. What has happened to us. Mr. So Dele. when the Jigawa lawyer is speaking, or Mr. the Dele. Kaduna lawyer is speaking, Mr. they Farrow can Timmy. reduce it. To I'm, those not, I'm not trying arguments. to interject. I I'm just want to say that uh, in the absence of not having this man to respond to some of the words you're using against them. Uh, can we just try to avoid the labeling no, I've not you're giving to them? I have just simply said, this is a, no, these are matters of fact. If a person is on record as having refused to obey the judgment of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, and I speak specifically to the case of the legal state government against the federal government during the, the tenure of General Basojo. So I'm not speaking without legal basis. I speak specifically in relation to Governor Wike when I speak about the demolition of hotels and the actions by executive fiat. So I'm not speaking without legal basis. I am not a careless person. I might be brutal in speaking that. the truth, <laughs> but I am, not, I am not a frivolous person or I'm not flippant either. I speak with specificities. Okay. I, I, I haven't accused you of that. I'm just saying that in their absence, because you would have to make us go to this man to react to some of the words you've also used. But it's okay. Uh, but let's look at... Um, I, I like the fact that you just don't look at where we started. You went deeper into what led to this invitation and the withdrawal. Staying on where we are now, having given us this foundation, can we look at... Uh, some of the issues raised, they mentioned the issue of not governing the people of Kaduna, and now it has turned out, we saw Murik, which is a Muslim rights uh, concern, raising issue, we saw largely Muslim lawyers giving it these, is it, is, are we being economical to say that it is definitely taking religious and uh, ethnic dimension? Look, everything Nigerian is subjectively interpreted through the prisms 
of religion or ethnicity. This has always been the case. Even among the lawyers? And it is not about to change now. Now, the problem in Southern Kaduna is essentially religious as it is ethnic. So you have a combination of the two volatilities in the Nigerian space, religion and ethnicity. Now, the persons who have raised cause or issue with Governor El Rufai's invitation are specific, amongst other things, in dealing with the issue of Southern Kaduna and the many problems that have arisen therefrom. And that is the specific basis, that is one of the most specific basis of their own objection to his invitation. You can be sure that there would always be the other side that would have reason to believe that whatever you have said that he's doing wrong, he's doing wrong in their own service or on their behalf, or they are the beneficiaries of whatever El Rufai has done. So on the basis of that, there would always be persons who would defend him because everybody would have their own supporters. Now, I do not know the facts beyond the fact that there has been a total breakdown of security in Southern Kaduna and the governor does not appear to have acted responsibly or spoken responsibly either. I have heard a couple of the things he said. Now, what he has said and what he has done might be two different things, but he has not spoken well. So when the people who raised the objection to his invitation premise their objection mostly on the basis of what he has done related to Southern Kaduna, you can be sure that those who believe that he has done right in Southern Kaduna would always come out to defend him. Ethnicity and religion are major factors in interpretation of every Nigerian issue. Unfortunately so, but that okay. is the reality. My own position is different. I believe that anyone who is looking at the persons invited should look at the general principle and begin to ask, are these fit and proper persons to assemble, uh, to bring before an assemblage of lawyers? That is the only point from where I'm looking at it. That El Rufai should not be attending, should not be anywhere near a gathering of lawyers, definitely, that is my belief. But my own position is not premised solely on Southern Kaduna. His utterances there are not the best at any point in time, but it's just his general behavior when it comes to the rule of law and his attitude to the supremacy of the law. That is my own basis okay. of uh, objection to his attendance. I, I, I would have actually loved to quickly have your take, but probably along the line when you're responding, you will also put it into perspective. Because I, I guess, I'm not too sure, that uh, he was a lawyer before he became a governor, and by, 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 by the virtue of the fact that he's a lawyer, he can attend your conference, right? Maybe not as a speaker now. If he was, of course, as an attendee, nobody would look. Okay, that's Vika is, an, Vika is a lawyer. If he was there as an attendee, you, that would be fine okay. and dandy. He pays his dues. You, you, he's entitled to attend. I just want that to know that. Thing. But to offer him a pulpit, that's different. That, 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 that's, uh, I, I know it's still debatable because I was coming into the issue that has been brought up now. Uh, listening to the former Emir of Kanu, he mentioned the fact that there were no specifics in the petition, that they were just saying that uh, he's not handling the state well. And that's subjective, like you've also pointed out. Then he's also mentioned the issue of there is no freedom of speech if he's going to be taken down by what you said he has said and he's not going to be speaking. So do you also see these views as actually non-substantial issues? You see... Um, the emir, the, the, the former emir, might see El Rufai as his friend, with whom he might feel free to speak the truth without fear. <laughs> but uh, Malam El Rufai has not 
proven to be such a benign force. Especially if one goes by his utterances, it's not a man you want to cross without some caution. Uh, there is a gentleman that is generally known as Daddy Yata. Nobody knows where that man where that is today. Nobody is talking. They, 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 that, he's not the only one. People who are opposed to Governor El Rufai have a tendency to end up having one problem or the other with the Kaduna State law enforcement apparatus or the judiciary. So I can understand why someone like Chidi Odinkalu, who was already being prepared for passage to Kaduna State on some very funny order of a funny, very funny court order without a suit number, I can understand how he will be leery of asking questions of a man who has publicly boasted that the two persons who have dared to look his way, one is in the grave and the other person is nicely retired in Notoke. So that's not a man you want to be crossing if you want, to, if you can avoid it. So they, I think they've done the proper thing by putting in their petition, really. You can't ask more, more than that. And they put their names to it. And that's fair enough. Okay, uh, uh, Mr. Farutimi, I'm so happy you mentioned a name because a yes, uh, few hours ago we had uh, Professor Din Kalu on the news and uh, as if you just watched that uh, news, it was, so, uh, it was so unequivocal on his disapproval of uh, 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 Governor Erufai attending MBA. And that brings me to the next question. It appears, according to one of the uh, senior advocates of Nigeria, uh, by name, A.U. Mustafa, who is a senior advocate of Nigeria, like I mentioned, he did say that MBA should not allow itself to be drawn into personal vendetta. Someone will, rem someone will argue that the likes of Femi Falano is angry because of the case between the, uh, you remember the Shite leader, who happens to be the lawyer, and what has been happening between him and that of Cardinal State Governor. Should we also look at those people speaking as having issues with El Rufai and not necessarily whether he's competent to speak or not? I'm not talking about you now. I'm looking at these voices that are, you know, resisted you the see, person. Um, I, I have always been in the habit of listening to the message without the message, focusing yeah. on the message there. Erufa is a public person, is a public official occupying a very sensitive position, multicultural, multi religious state, a very volatile state. His dealings with Mr. Odin Kalu, Chidi Odin Kalu, is not, they are not particularly secret. They are out there, out in the open. They've been, their spat have been on for a while. But in reality, my own focus has been on the point, the validity of the allegations. If the man has not done these things, nobody would accuse him of these things. That the person making the accusation is not his friend does not invalidate the substance of the accusation. You might subjectify the accusations by looking at the person making them. But when you've done that, you now need to move beyond the persons and look at the substance. And the fact is that the substance are unquestioned. Mr. El Rufai has proven to be particularly nasty in his dealings with Mr. Odin Kalu and with all the other persons that have had occasion to complain. His voice is, is out there in the public domain. I think the problem these days is that people forget that their words live on beyond the time when they utter these words. And, and the words are there. The actions are there. He's a public officer, and the words are there out in the open. So, I, yeah, I heard them when they say that uh, this, person, this person is not his friend. Yeah, his friends are not going to raise petitions against him. <laughs> but it is the substance of the petition that should be focused on. It is what is done or is not done. Nobody has accused him of rape. They haven't said he done anything like that. They've not said, oh, he ran somebody over. He was a hit and run driver. They haven't said that either. 
what they are saying is that this man has no respect for the rule of law, however much he might protest it, and that his actions in the public space over the years would suggest that he is not the kind of person that is fit and proper to be invited to a gathering of lawyers to come and speak. Because if our association says that it is committed to the promotion of the rule of law, what does it say when it now offers its pedestals to men who have not committed their time in the public space to the promotion of either the law or its rule? But, but, but Mr. Farrow, so do, you, do you also share the opinion of those who said, why don't you allow him come, let us engage him, let him answer questions that we have concerning his activities? What about that? Since there's going to be a panel discussion. You, you know, it's, very, it's all well and good for people to speak of mitigation. But you must also remember that the point of departure between the question you are asking me and my own position is that I am already of the opinion that Mr. El Rufai should never have been invited ab initio. So for me, that they have found any reason whatsoever to disqualify him from speaking, me, I'm all well and good with it, and I'm fine and dandy with that. And by the same token, I just hope that they will get rid of the other two. And I'm hoping that when Mr. Alumedia Apata inherits the poison chalice that Mr. Usora is passing to him, he will learn from this and be careful about who he invites for future conferences. Simple. Okay. Just use the same standard for everybody. Invite people I, who respect the rule of law. End of story. We don't I, have this controversy. I was going to ask you for the way out, but I think you stated your position. But finally, what do we do about the dimension NBA has taken now? If the North is believing that they, they, they are the target, uh, I, I think this, is, this should be worrying to you, you know, looking at what the NBA is turning out to be. What do you think we should do? Or what do you think NBA should do? Nah, there is nothing, nah, there is nothing worrying there. This is a squabble. This is a squabble that is not found on principles. It's found on emotions. It's not found on any principles. Fact of the matter is that it will blow over. But by the time it's done blowing over, it is, I hope, going to be a lesson for the NBA going forward because it could it could have avoided this this is a controversy that it should never have found itself enmeshed in this is a self-inflicted wound there is very little that can be done other than to just you know, they would have to write it out i'm hoping that better sense will prevail and they will use the opportunity handed by this act of is a very is a rather careless act by the executives it should, it should, they should have been more careful. This was, this was, the, they should have been more careful, especially as it relates to the optics. They should have been by far more careful. They've goofed already. There is very little anyone can do about this. Hopefully, Mr. Lumide Apata will learn from it going forward. That's the only thing anyone can hope. There is nothing else to be done. Thank you so much, Mr. Dele Faro, to me for your insight on this issue uh, while it remains your opinion and not the opinion of Plus TV Africa. I would like to reiterate that. Thank you for your time. We hope to have you talk some more. Thank you very much. On some other me. national issues. Yeah, we'll take a short break and we'll listen to a report. Then when I come back, I'll be rounding off. Please don't go anywhere. The Situation Room has expressed worry over the escalation of violence between the two major political parties in Edo State, the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and the All Progressives Congress, APC, ahead of the upcoming governorship election. The convener of the Situation Room, Ernest Uwankwo, while speaking to newsmen in Abuja, said public statements by the two major contenders have continued to heighten tensions in the state. Situation Room is concerned about the rhetorics and isolated incidents of violence in Edo State ahead of the September 19, 2020 governorship election. Public statements by candidates and the political parties, especially the two main parties, is heightening political tension in the state. 
and stoking violence. Issue-based campaigns have been relegated to the background and citizens are not being offered any real electoral choices. Recent actions by political actors indicate threats to the peaceful conduct of elections, including squabbles over membership and leadership of the State House Assembly in that state. In addition to violence-leading campaigns, Situation Room is worried that these campaigns are being conducted in total disregard of COVID-19 pandemic protection protocols of campaign and voting. Escalation of COVID-19 cases represent a threat to voter turnout and participation in the election. Situation Room welcomes INEX trial of a portal whereby voters and the public at large can see their polling unit level results online within hours of voting, closing. We have seen the poll at the week, uh, in recent uh, days at the National State Assembly polls where this was tried out. Mm -hmm. We are calling on the security agencies like we did you know, mention here. These persons are not above the law. When people make such statements that run foul of the Electoral Act, they should, the state agencies of state should be provoked to make arrests. Let them make statements because they are criminalized conduct. And, you know, constantly we are seeing that they are counting on non-state actors, purveyors of violence, by political violence and entrepreneurs. Why is, why is the Nigerian police not acting now? That is the big question. They should desist from giving the impression of institutional bias. People should be under arrest and investigation. The situation room has expressed worry over the escalation. It is said that what started off as a protest of some kind of petition by some group of lawyers has turned out to be a religious and ethnic face-off among lawyers in Nigeria. As Olumide Apata led executive of the NBA resume in the upcoming conference, a big task is ahead of them to unite lawyers irrespective of their ethnic and religious bias. And that is my take tonight on Plus Politics. Plus Politics returns same time tomorrow, 7 p.m. And trust me, it promises to be bumper than what you've had tonight. I remain yours truly, Coyote Ladende. Saying bye.